and dear colleagues, um, we've learned um, it's not a question whether we should screen for atrial fibrillation in hypertension. We have learned how we could do this. And I would like to focus a little bit on in whom should we do this. These are my declarations. And if you look at the population, I come from the epidemiology part, you see that um, there is a huge overlap in population-based cohorts from Europe with those developing atrial fibrillation, incident atrial fibrillation, and elevated blood pressure, hypertension. So of course, we need, and as early as possible, to address hypertension and elevated blood pressure, we need at the population level to decrease blood pressure. On the other hand, we also need to focus on those at high risk for developing atrial fibrillation. And this is probably not the 35-year-old individual, but rather older individuals who will develop atrial fibrillation early on or who may already have intermittent, undiagnosed atrial fibrillation, which poses them at high risk of developing a stroke, heart failure, and other adverse outcomes. And Ben Friedman and group, they have put together data on more than 140,000 individuals from population-based cohorts, and they checked how it looks like if you do a single point screening, single time point screening, you see the older individuals get, the more atrial fibrillation you will identify. And if you look into those individuals age 65 or older, you will find 1.4% newly detected atrial fibrillation and this is quite a bit for a non-invasive, very simple procedure. Okay, so let's look not only a single time pod, but it looks very intensively. Let's do continuous monitoring in patients at risk of stroke um, with risk factors such as, in many cases, um, hypertension in the loop study performed in Denmark. And those individuals were randomized to either um, conventional care or to implantation of a loop recorder in 1,500 individuals. And indeed, they found 31, so almost one-third individuals with newly detected atrial fibrillation compared to the conventional care arm, 12%. And over time, the individuals with newly detected atrial fibrillation were anticoagulated, and over time, you see that the risk of stroke and systemic arterial embolism, the primary endpoint of this study, was lower in the ILR, internal loop recorder group, but this trial did not meet its primary statistical outcome endpoint of 0.05, um, but showed a p-value of 0.1. So overall, rather negative. If you look at the ZAP groups, you very uniformly see that screening, even with very intensive screening, appears to reduce the risk of stroke and systemic embolism. So on the left-hand side of the one of the hazard ratio. And what you can see in those with high blood pressure, uncontrolled hypertension, there was a significant benefit for atrial fibrillation detection and oral anticoagulation. They performed a, spe a specified ZAP analysis, and here again they could demonstrate that uh, it's ambiguous in individuals with um, lower blood pressure or, um, or borderline blood pressure, but from a blood pressure of 150 millimeters mercury systolic, there appears to be a reduction in risk of stroke and systemic embolism if they screened for atrial fibrillation and identified atrial fibrillation. Um, AF screen together with an EU consortium, we um, performed um, measures and studies how we can improve and refine the screening for atrial fibrillation. First, we looked at known, existing, and there are many more, this is just an example, risk scores for atrial fibrillation. And what I've highlighted here is that all of these scores have at least one measure of hypertension or even several measures such as blood pressure measures or, or pulse pressure or more detailed hypertension and blood pressure measures that enter these highly selected risk scores. So a common risk factor for incident atrial fibrillation. 
And even if you use medical records in over 4 million individuals, if you look across um, atrial fibrillation screening studies and put together the clinical variables among them to pr define uh, risk prediction models and create algorithms, you see the blue curve here, the upper curve, you are better if you have more variables in predicting atrial fibrillation risk, but the most important variables always are age and hypertension. And you can use this information and put it into a physician software to prompt physicians and healthcare professionals to screen for atrial fibrillation. Another question then is, of course, health economics and acceptability that needs to be addressed. We wanted to go even further and see whether we can see subclinical changes related to hypertension in the ECG. Just a 12-lead ECG or even reduced to a single lead, a one lead, a lead one ECG, that using machine learning algorithms, we could indeed from the ECG predict the prevalence of hypertension. That means early on there are subclinical changes invisible to, to the human eye that indicate changes related to hypertension. And of course, this has been shown by the Mayo Clinic group and many others, we could also do this. We can predict incident atrial fibrillation from an ECG in sinus rhythm. Let's go even further and look at circulating biomarkers. Because we think that circulating biomarkers may mirror all the classical risk factors, such as hypertension, but also um, atrial fibrillation burden, atrial cardiomyopathy and cardiac dysfunction, and thus predict prevalent but intermittent incident atrial fibrillation and its adverse outcomes. And we have also done machine learning algorithms comparing them with classical statistics for many biomarkers that are related to the pathophysiology of atrial fibrillation, combine them with clinical variables, and what comes out of these classical statistical models and machine learning models, we usually use random forest selection models, it was age, as you all know now, as the strongest predictor of hypertension and atrial fibrillation, and a second biomarker, anti-proBNP, B-type natriuretic peptide. It is closely related to um, hypertension variables because it is central to blood pressure regulation, volume homeostasis, and sodium concentration regulation in the body. So this makes absolute sense. Anti-proBNP, pro-hormone, fragment, um, also BNP, the strongest predictors of atrial fibrillation. And also if you do genetics, which we have done here and other uh, groups, that you put together all the available genetic information to predict, in this case, prevalent atrial fibrillation. And the more risk alleles you have, the higher your risk of, for atrial fibrillation. But what you can also see among those top genes and genetic areas, always loci with, related to hypertension come up. And if you compare on the left-hand side, um, polygenic risk score quartiles and age, you will see highest risk score, risk score quartile and highest age, highest incidence of atrial fibrillation. On the right-hand side, with similar accuracy, highest concentrations of anti-proBNP and highest age, highest risk of atrial fibrillation development. And this can be used um, also for screening. It has been done in the Stroke Stop 2 study, and you see that anti-proBNP here performs better than the chats vest score at the bottom here, the highest quartile of anti-proBMP, very well predicted, finding new detected, screen detected atrial fibrillation during a dedicated screening study. And the results of this study using anti-proBNP for um, pre-selection refined screening for atrial fibrillation will be presented during a hotline session this afternoon. So I would like to summarize that Elevated blood pressure and hypertension um, are a strong comorbidities in atrial fibrillation. Elevated blood pressure is a strong predictor of incident and screen detected atrial fibrillation. The association of elevated blood pressure with increased stroke systemic embolism has been shown in many studies. You know it from the Chatsvast score. 
Blood pressure is a consistent variable in risk prediction algorithms. All algorithms contain it. Uh, blood pressure measures systolic, diastolic, pulse pressure, and other measures related to blood pressure, or subclinical changes related to blood pressure. I sh showed you the ECG, I showed you biomarkers, are among the known and emerging biomarkers for, for refined atrial fibrillation screening. The effectiveness for refined screening, however, has to be shown. Thank you very much.